I didn't really think about it until we were on our way down here, but today is actually, I think, the first day of fall, September 22nd, ooh, 2022, a lot of twos in there, and it's still warm like it can be in September, but we got a cold front coming through, and I think we're going to have a change of season the next couple of days. Yeah. I'm here with Captain Kenny Marshall. Um, honored to be here with him. He's one of a handful of people that I've learned an awful lot about over the years about not just decoy making and the out of doors, but life. And I'm very honored to be able to have a mentor such as yourself. So it's fun to be able to sit here and have a conversation like we do a lot of times on the porch or under Pete's oak tree. <laughs> yeah. Um, so Kenny, are you, where were you born? Uh, Born down at Deswatick Hospital, the old thing, but of course back home again. And I grew up and raised in Willis Wharf. In Willis Wharf. And uh, <clears throat> spent my whole childhood there. Uh, it, was grew, Willis Wharf a lot different back then than it is now? Or? It was probably as many homes, uh, not many new homes have been built, but everybody knew everybody else. I don't know, I bet I don't know half a dozen people in Willis Wharf right now. Uh, <clears throat> But I knew everybody there, and as kids, we'd run around like a little gang and uh, stop and play ball in this yard or whatever, pick up pecans in another yard. And I felt comfortable to go to any house in the wharf, knock on the door, hey, can I have a glass of water? <laughs> you know, and uh, everybody just knew everybody else. Yeah. I'd known them all my life, and of course, well, most of them had kids, you know, they were parents, but. Uh, and then, of course, the old uh, general store had, Willis Wharf at that time had four general stores. Wow. Uh, <clears throat> of course, most of them sold a lot of hardware, too, for working watermen, anchors and gear and oil skins and stuff like that. But, uh, and I remember old Will Johnson had a bin full of nails, different sizes on a rack. You just pick it up and reach in and grab them, throw them on scale. And, uh, Weigh out your nails. Yeah, we'll <laughs> get however many you want. And, uh, oh, and uh, as a kid, they also had a big bin, almost the same thing. Boy, they, it was a big old cr cracker, I mean a, a cookie about that big, Johnny Cakes. Okay. And uh, they were a penny a piece. And after school, get off the bus, one, go in there and grab one of them Johnny Cake. <laughs> get after treat. school, sir. That was a real treat. Yeah, the school bus stopped right there. When I went, uh, I walked out of school a lot of times so that I could skip school. <laughs> I could just jump off in the graveyard and hide until <laughs> till my neighbor came by. I saw him walking home. I knew it was time, time for me to go home. Which school was that? It's more well, it's Wharf, the old one that they tore down. Okay. Yeah. So that was in between on the way from Exmoor down to Willis. Uh -huh. And I could walk out right behind where I live now, because that's where I lived then, uh, and just walk right straight out. It was a field, farmer's field road, right straight out to the, yeah. across from the highway, well, from the uh, school. <clears throat> My throat's getting ready to go. Now you've always I'm been right. an outdoorsman and an observer of nature. You told me one time about you had a pet crow. Was that when oh, you were young? Oh, yeah, yeah, that... It's amazing. Uh, named him Joe, of course. But my dad got him out of a, a nest. He'd fallen, or was by him. He wasn't in the nest, but he was a nestling, couldn't fly or anything. And dad took him home to me and said, Hey, you got a pet. You got to take care of him. And uh, we had a back porch that was had the screens in it. But it was, uh, he wanted to roost up on one of the sills. So I cut a little hole in the screen. <laughs> and uh, it's amazing what he would find. He loved gaudy things. He had that whole top thing with little uh, buttons or uh, marbles that the kids had played with and all kind of shiny little things. And uh, he would fly off and go with the flock of crows, the wild flock, fly all around with them. And come back in the evening and come land right on my shoulder. <laughs> How old were you when, when that was roughly? I was about seven or eight years oh, old. Oh, wow. Yeah, really young. And, uh, 
and they kept him around for three or four years, and he finally, my neighbor, an old hog owner, Chester, Chester Simpson, had a uh, steel barrel that he used to work on his outboard motor. He could stick it in there and shoot a pump, and he fell down in that and drowned. I'm couldn't, there. couldn't get out. That's what happened to him. You, um, but he was a good little pet. <laughs> that, that sounds like a real, just interesting thing as a kid to have. And you, you mentioned your dad Dad found him. I also know that, I mean, your dad really took you on a lot of adventures, didn't he? And yeah. Uh, from the time I could see my toddler, from the time I could walk, if he went <coughs> anywhere, if he went out to work in the garden, if he got in the boat and went, if I was out of school, uh, he went clamming, I went with him. If he went fishing, I went with him. He went gill nothing or setting that, so whatever, anything, wherever he was, I was right there too. And uh, he was really my best friend that, growing up, my dad. And uh, he was funny, he kind of had some funny way of telling you, it. <clears throat> if I'd say, oh, dad, I lost my ball over there by that tree. He'd say, what kind of tree is that? <laughs> and he said, always be specific. It's either a maple tree, a cedar tree, or a hickory tree. What is it? You know, and that's, that was everything. It didn't matter what. You had to be exact in describing it, you know. Uh, well, that probably laid some groundwork for how you've been real observant with nature. Right? You maybe. Too, uh, know your birds. And... Yeah. He, uh, he was big on that, too. Uh, he'd say... Uh, we ought to be able to see a few uh, what we call hairy heads or uh, hooded meganser. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <coughs> They'd come about the middle of December. But he would say, we ought to be able to see some of them tomorrow. And sure enough, tomorrow there'll be a flock of them <laughs> coming in. You know, he, he had it timed down. <laughs> and uh, he, he was real, of course, he was real handy too. Uh, he built boats as a, as a sideline, smaller boats. And that cedar, I think the smell of that, new, that uh, North Carolina juniper is what might have triggered me off carving a little bit. You uh -huh. know, just, that's what you use. Did you ever use any of the scraps from his boat building? Yeah, that's along? what I used okay. a lot yeah. of it. Later on, this was later on. Right, right. But uh, <clears throat> he would uh, be real specific about in fact, he was working on a, a, a you know, y'all know what a monitor is? Eastern Shore monitor. They use them for hauling oysters and stuff. A, like a decked over A wooden for... barge. Okay. Uh, yeah. Most of them are between 50 and 80 feet, wow. maybe 20 feet wide and decked over. And I had a job when I was about 12 years old. They were, Victor Simpson was building one of caulking the decks. Let me see. You what my first job, yeah. My knocking hand. the oakum into the mm -hmm. scene so yeah. she was waterproof. Right. Right. But at, a, at the same time, my dad was doing a job on a boat that they had up on the railway. And uh, <clears throat> a couple of them old hog on boy here. That John Elf, he's the damnest thing I've ever seen. He just it, it took, took a square up there and drew a circle with it. <laughs> So a framer square, but the right. table man. put a nail in the way, you know, and just worked it around. But they couldn't, they couldn't figure out how he, how he drew a circle with a square. <laughs> well, that is a, a little bit of a contradiction <coughs> in terms, right? Well, um, so when you say a railway, um, and that was down in Willis Wharf. Yeah. What, what for folks that don't know, what what was a railway back All right, then? Uh, it actually had train rails running down into the creek. It was tidal, of course. And uh, it would end about completely bare on low water, but on high water it would be, it was about a five foot tide drop at Willis right. Wharf. And it had cradles going all the way across it. So a fairly good sized boat could get on there. And you'd have to put wedges under the chines of the dead rise to keep it from going one way or the other. And uh, <clears throat> all those old flat monitors. Just laid him up there, and that's that was another dirty job. You ever hear someone's got a song they call it a dirty job? Yeah. Cleaning the bottom of a boat. Cleaning the bottom of a boat. Yeah. That was the job. I was 
12, 15 kids, meet other boys too. Grown man wouldn't do it. <laughs> but on low water, we'd have to crawl under that boat and scrape all the barnacles and grass. And, all the fouling. And take it out and grow brooms and scrub it down and all that stuff. And the whole time, the only way you could do it was laying in the mud. Out there. You know, and reaching up. You had to make that much room between you and Whew. <clears throat> but so you'd haul they, that was a way to haul the boats out yeah, and work on right. them or yeah wow did, did you get paid good for that uh i forgot it wasn't much i don't remember how but uh, a couple of johnny cakes yeah <laughs> yeah. I don't, yeah they paid me and paid me as much as they would put anybody they paid me, but uh i had i saved all that I, every year that i was in grammar school i paid Worked in the summer enough to pay for my own books oh, wow. for that year. You used to have to buy your school books. You had to buy them, and they were yours. And you could trade them in the next year to the next class coming up or whatever. A lot of people did. <clears throat> but I don't know. I just felt like I was supposed to earn my own way. Well, over the years, you've certainly had some very interesting jobs uh, <laughs> that I know of. And I know some of it started out working on the water and... Uh, Gill netting sharks and nipping up oysters <clears throat> and yeah, Larry Hamlin and I, uh, another old hog owner, uh, were the first ones to catch sharks. Sharks, it was not illegal. I mean, they weren't uh, they weren't a restaurant or people didn't eat sharks. Wasn't a big market for no, them at that time. Uh, and uh, so we, you had to skin them. And, uh, the, uh, and the first ones we caught was a guy who was going to make shark skin leather uh, luggage. Right. But that didn't work out. Either. We couldn't skin them right. And he didn't say, no, that won't work. And I gave it up. But uh, <clears throat> we got uh, Jim's father. He was a hustler. He got up with some guy, and he had a market for steak fish. And that's what we call, we'd have to clean the hides off the sharks. And... Uh, stink them up, you know, but the whole thing with no bones or just a, but uh, <clears throat> So this day, if you're eating steak fish at a fish fry, it's, it's probably sharp. Probably yeah. sharp, probably thresher or something like right. that. Yeah. But they, they made it illegal later on they, they claimed that the sand sharks were getting more and more rare and they cut the market down. But uh, we didn't have Nylon, uh, monofilament that, 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 that day. So we used cotton, plain old cotton. Cotton gill nets? Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> and uh, of course they were white and you had to kind of dye them out a little bit with, uh, and uh, used, used, uh, shoot, what do I want to say? Uh, oil and base city stuff. Yeah, that, uh, that tar. Yeah, yeah. But made it real, real thin. Just, yeah. just brined it up a little bit is all. How, how, how would, how would, what would that? Because that cotton, I guess, didn't stand up too good, so it helped no. it last too. How did you, how did you get the dye right. on the net? What would happen? Well, you just, uh, just throw barrels of it on top okay. of it, and then take that, throw it back overboard. Um, the, the, uh, the, the, I lost my train of thought here. That happens a lot. The. Uh, Problem with the cotton is, uh, you ever hear of a, 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 something going through a heat? If you pile up a pile of rope or something, and uh, even even a pile of uh, shavings will do it. Uh, at the shell, remember the sawmills? Yeah, yeah. Used yeah. to mill up in the, in the woods, and the, and the fire would the, catch. The heat the, would build up enough yeah. from yeah. And uh, that would happen with our nets. Oh wow! Different. But to stop that. You had to throw, we had to mix up uh, lime water. Lime water. Just get dry lime and duck it in water, mix it in, and toss it on over the bucket. Huh. And uh, <clears throat> as you're getting your net in, about every 30, 40 feet, you throw a bucket of lime on it. And wow. that keep it from going through there. Never heard of that. The one. Heat. Yeah. Yeah. So, did y'all drifted then, your nets? Was mm -hmm. that out in Hog Island, maybe? Yeah. Or Hog Island Bay? We sat right in the inlet, right at the mouth of the inlet. On uh, maybe two hours in the flood tide, we sat right down and the time to set the net, the exactly right time to set the net, was when a Marshall Rock 
on Sand Shoal, I mean, uh, uh, Sandy Island covered. You said you had a, you a landmark. See that, see that <laughs> over our, way off, half a mile off, out of the channel. And when the top of that covered, such a net. How about that? And uh, The tide rips through there <clears throat> yeah. at, at that time. I bet uh, that was tough. That, uh, that channel is about 10 miles by the booted up channel. Right. And that would drift up maybe four to five miles. So you started the inlet and drifted in. Yeah. Okay. Of course, we were about two hours into flood tide and have about four hours to drift. <clears throat> and when it stopped, that's when you took it because when it come back in, it wouldn't tangle up. What, what kind of sharks did you catch mainly? Sand, sand sharks. Sand sharks. That was basically it. Once in a while, you get a uh, hammerhead. And they were mean rascals. <laughs> oh, yeah. And uh, a few uh, spot tail, uh, black tips. If they got really out of them, inlet too far, they pick up them. And a tiger shark here and there. Or, oh, no one was a lemon shark. I forgot to tell oh, you that yeah. one ago. They didn't have any teeth. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you know, they, okay. they feed through plankton. Well, um, how did, how did, was that a one man thing, a two man team? How did that process two, work? What did the feed? Your, the, when you were gill netting for them? Two, two of me and Larry. You and Larry? And uh, we had a boat. And uh, we had a rack stood up. And the, the boat, the floats, well, the lead line, the line had to have lead. You've seen it with a little lead thing you clamp on the line. Mm -hmm. The lead line. And uh, that had to be just about the same as the float line. You wanted it kind of what, neutral. Right. But the float line, because the, the channels were so deep and our nets were only 30 feet deep, you had to have a block of white cedar buoy. Another, another exposure another, to white cedar. Another exposure to white cedar. They were about six by six. I've seen one of them around here somewhere. I thought it was one. Do y'all didn't y'all have one of those around here at the time? Sometime it was just a square yeah. with a taper down in a hole through it. Yeah, they have got an artifact in the museum. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, uh, it had about an eight foot snood, and uh, you'd have to stand there, and then that is running out as you run the boat along, and as it come up, you throw it out as far as you can, try to get the webbing straight out. Mm -hmm. And that was hard work, boy. When I was a kid, just boom, throwing <laughs> things out. And then but you, when, you, you, when you, you got done, you rested for about four hours, then you could whew, take the net in. And that was around the clock, right. night and day, night and day. Wow. What every, time every of year high, was that? Every high water. That was in the summer. It had to be in warm the summer, water. yeah. And then uh, after shark fishing, uh, I'd go to. Uh, either signing clams or uh, tonguing oysters, catching oysters by the noose. When you say signing clams, um, what, okay. what is that kind of, you know? You know what a clam, a sign has, a clam has a little, you've seen it, a little snake, like, not very big. And if you look straight in, it's shaped like an eight. It has an incoming hole and an outcoin. And uh, that's the way they feed. They bury down in the bottom enough so they can stick it straight out through the water, through the bottom. And they siphon in water and, and filter out the nutrients and eject it again. And when they ejected it out, it, either the flow of the water would make a little spot because the water that deep, I mean, the mud that deep was always bluer than the surface. Surface water was bleached out by the sun, I guess. So you'd see, you'd see those signs you could, on low tide yeah. on the mud flat. Yeah, and on a heavy, on a muddy flat, it would leave a little keyhole shaped sign. And that's what we call them those sink signs, litter signs, keyhole signs, uh, blue signs, and what else? Did I say litter sign? Yeah. We called that something else, but yeah. that's the PG yeah, version. Most people <laughs> did. Well, um, and so then you, you dig that individual clam up. Right, one at a time. Yeah. One at a time. And uh, that, that's, that's kind of a, a lost part, art. Well, the tricky part is uh, to while you're, when, you're, when you're on this one, you're looking for another one. And you've got a clam to go to. So you get that in, you go right to this next back. You've got to, always got a sign to go to. And uh, 
I've caught 3,000 single clams and one tide did it twice, but I never could get over that. <laughs> well, maybe that was the ceiling. <clears throat> three times, I mean two times, I've caught 3,000. So you figure low tide on a mud flat is maybe four or five hours maybe? Yeah, if that. yeah. If so, that, yeah. So of course, you can work a whole, 3, pretty much a whole, you know, as soon as the tide gets out of the marsh. Work up towards <clears throat> the marsh. Uh, and then, uh, of course, our string, I did tongue in on that. And, uh, I'm telling you about that the ice would freeze and pick up oysters and then float out and it would melt and the oysters would drop singly. And that's where those nippers come from. So that was a small tongue. Talking about a while ago about the nippers. You see those, those little clumps or singles out there in the middle of the mud flat and I've always wondered yeah, how that, they got that, there and they're alive. Yes, yeah, that's how they got there. And then in the fall of the year, my dad always wanted to catch a bunch of fatbacks. Uh, jumping mullets is the real name. We call them fatbacks. And uh, they're not fit to eat. I didn't think, I didn't like them. They're bony. And, <laughs> but uh, it was a point, a uh, filing point off of Red Bank Creek. Point ran out and Dave was running, said the point was out like this. Dave was running his net out like that maybe, and stake it down. And then he'd send me up here, put me overboard, but it's like this. And I could go along smacking the water, making noise, doing all the good, running to hurt school down to get in that net. And they would gill in it when they hit it. Wow. And uh, then we'd go to haul her in and had to clean them, which they didn't. Just split them down the back, flip them over, flip them the gut tape, and that was it. And then lay them in, in layers of salt. So, so you, um, would, you, were, you were brining them down right. to store them for and the winter. I remember Dad used to always said your brine's got to be just right to float a raw egg. Oh. That was how he told, that was how he, he judged when it was salted yeah. or not too salty. Because yeah. if it's too salty, the fish will get real hard and crumble it really. Oh yeah, it was completely dried mm -hmm. out. So you were just trying to preserve it right. long enough. And then, is that something right. that would happen in the fall for the winter, or did you do that all year round? Or No, that was just in a little while in the fall. They'd come up in the fall, and they'd be gone by first frost or so. Um, uh, they'd come up. They migrated from Carolina. They were, they were coastal. They'd go all up. How would y'all prepare <coughs> them to eat them? Uh, take them out of the cask of brine. Soak them all night long. Next morning, mom would bring them, put them in fresh water and bring them to a boil. Then she'd take them out, bring, pour that water off, put them in a, and bring them to another boil. And then pour that off and then she, she'd fry them. They got enough salt out of them to cook. And you said that was in the morning? That was so, that morning. That was so, a, yeah, we, at some time we already had them for breakfast. And then we'd fry potatoes. Uh. Fried potatoes and fat back for breakfast. Right. <clears throat> uh, that's not on a lot of menus anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, let's see, what else was it I did? Oh, uh, I used to go tarpon hunting. <clears throat> you could get a uh, dollar a piece for a tarpon if its undershell was over five inches. Talking about the, the diamondback the diamond tarpon back, and the yeah, estuarine uh, turtle. Up in these salt marshes, you see them, you know, you see them. And I had a little cast net. <laughs> or a little smaller gill net and I could just scull them right around. I see them come up and I put the net on the stern of my skiff and just scull. There's a way of moving, of maneuvering a, a, a boat called sculling. Real sculling is like up north, they stand up and row backwards. You know, they're standing up instead of pulling on the oars, they're pushing on the oars so they can look at where they're going. That's the real term sculling, but we call sculling uh, you, you can stick your oar over the stern of the boat and you got to turn it like that, yeah. like that, like that, like that. And that gives you, not, not going to get very far, but I've scored a long way, many a mile like that. That's what I learned sculling was your, <coughs> your, your oar was right out the back of the boat. Uh -huh. Did you normally uh -huh. stand right, up and right, it, was a, right. it was a twisting motion and, uh, as well? <coughs> we could get... Uh, I used to catch, in the, in the wintertime, catch seed oysters for the big oyster planters, Ballards, Walkers, Bowen, I always worked for Bowen. And uh, 
you catch a sea dorsal there's live, you know, just off the natural grounds. And uh, they would be only like this size. But you'd be in a scow that would hold a hundred bushel. Great big old scow. And I could stand on the stern of her, load it down with a hundred bushel, and just stand back to the scow, I guess. <laughs> and go on back to the lay boat to, wow. so we could tow them down and plant them overboard. Terrapins are uh, a, a salt water turtle, yeah. really. Uh, really not a turtle. A terrapin and a turtle are two different critters. But uh, they live in the water and feed on fiddler crabs mostly. And uh, but in the, when the tides up there, and they, but they have come up to breathe. You see them. That's why you have know where they are. And I had a little skiff. I could scull my little small net right around one of them, and bunch it up and bring him in. But you had to keep them alive for a while. And and down at where the E.O. Willis store is now, that was Johnson's grocery store. And down in front of that, he had a. Uh, Terrapin pound, a little one fenced in by that tall, and went all the way down to the low water and all the way up, and they could live, live in that, you know. Yeah. And uh, so like a holding let, pen, basically. Yeah, and yeah. he'd let us. Uh, oh, great, huh? Thank you. Nice ice, and uh, we used to get a, a dollar a piece. That was big time money at that time. But uh, what, what, roughly, how old were you when that was happening? I was probably in my teens. In your teens, okay. Yeah, so yes. that would have been uh, what decade, roughly? Sixty. I graduated nineteen sixty. So. So in the late fifties, early sixties. Sixty-five. Okay. Yeah, so and because uh, I think they were quite a delicacy in restaurants. Yeah, that was so. a big time tapping stew or tapping soup. Do you remember uh, people making that here locally as well? Or? No, we used to, uh, Daddy used to have them, but Mom wouldn't allow him to cook one in the house. Oh, really? Because she said it stinks the house up so bad when they're, <laughs> when they're cooking. <laughs> so one time my sister was born cross-eyed big time, and at three years old, or five, six, she said, anyway, I was about five or six years old. Mom and a aunt and a, some more took her to Durham, North Carolina, to get this eye operated on. They were oh. gone about three days, and uh, me and Dad eat tapping stew the whole time. Because <laughs> <laughs> your mom wasn't there to complain right. about the smell. <laughs> right. yeah. That's awesome. And uh, let's see what else I did. Oh, uh, on that clam boat. So, so this was a little later on. The clam boat was, uh, I did, I tend to do everything in 10 year increments. <laughs> I, uh, when I first got out of, well, let me tell you about my very first job I ever had right out of high school. If you all remember anything about it, the small surface clam archers died in Delaware Bay. Huh. They didn't have any seed orchards at all. So a, whole, a failure of right. settlement for a year or they two. They call that MSX or Oh, yeah, it was something. a disease, I remember. Yeah. And so there there got to be a market down here. And Harvey Bowen, well, ours died back too real bad. It wasn't much. You couldn't make a living catching it. But Harvey, Bob Bob Bowen, you met Bob Hogowler and uh, his dad. <clears throat> and they got two or three boats together. It was two of us, two boats. And we went to uh, Georgetown, South Carolina. And a guy named Tom Yorkey, who was the owner of uh, the Pirates, I believe, oh, some okay. professional football game. Anyway, he leased out or let us have this huge area of marsh. And it looked just like seaside, except it was probably a hundred acres of it. It was just little small dreams running through it. And the seed orchards from the top of the marsh all the way down the slope, across the bottom, and all the way up. So when you say the seed oysters, you're talking about yeah. the little ones that aren't <clears throat> right. big enough to harvest. <clears throat> right. And uh, the reason he wanted us to catch them because when they got any older, they would die down there. If something was wrong. Right. So uh, that was my very first job, and I'd never had left nor uh, well eastern shore. I'd probably been in Acomac County, but <laughs> <laughs> I knew I'd never been in. Uh, out of North Carolina, and uh, 
I graduated in that very fall is when we went down to catch those horses. And uh, there was an old boat called the Nancy K. And another one, a monitor with a, bat, with a cabin on her named the Pierce Sarrow. And uh, we slug along, we tie up nights and just slug along, about, about seven knots is about what so, we can make. So, so you were hauling those seed oysters well, we from South Carolina? we were going down Carolina. there with the boats oh, okay. first. We hauled the horses out with a truck. Oh, okay. But going down there to the place first took us about a week. Wow. And what made me think of this, we went through Camp Lejeune, the coastal waterway. Yeah. I think they've changed it now, but the coastal waterway went through Camp Lejeune. And as we were walking along, uh, Bob says, uh, I don't guess you want to go get in the army, do you? Look over there. And there's a <laughs> bunch of guys up to the water here, chest deep, packs on top of their head, waiting along. Doing their training. In a string. Training. Wow. <laughs> and then I thought about this uh, poison water or whatever infected yeah. water there. So many of them are dying that uh, the Clanton of June veterans or people who were there are yeah. dying off like crazy from this. Uh, contaminated water and the water was just as muddy as you couldn't see through it all yet but uh, so so where when those oysters were trucked off were they going <clears throat> up to delaware bay or where were they taking no, them no he would he would truck them up to uh his place and oh. load them on a barge and then haul them up to Delaware Bay. Okay, so they were trying the to... the people from Delaware Bay would come down with their own barges. They were trying to restock yeah. from the, <clears> the <throat> point when they had the failed recruitment. Okay. Bonnie Miles is dead, but uh, Donnie Jr., my senior, I guess, yeah. he bought a bunch of them that had a box tree and around. And for the, the general public, we to get catch mm -hmm. them. And, but we were... And... Uh, <clears throat> And then when I came, got back in the spring uh, from from that one trip, it was just a winter's trip down there with Bob, uh, I made a bunch of almost invented uh, peeler pots. <laughs> made them way dirty. They don't look like anything like to do today, but uh, I read about somebody on the base side was making these peeler pots. And, so I bought the wire, me and my dad made 25, 30 of them. And uh, so I sat down my, right on the seaside and made good, did, did good catching, loaded up with peelers. Were, were, you, <clears throat> were you selling them to people to shed them in the soft crabs? Yeah, or? I'd sell them up at, uh, what was his name, at, on, on, the, on the bridge. Junior at Spence? Yeah, on the bridge equipment. Yeah. And then after that, I started raking clams and signing clams. That was a winter thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, the summer thing. And then from then on, Oh, I had, uh, this was later on, I had four nice gill nets. And, uh, <clears throat> I was, uh, that was after I got back from working. I was between one of my clam boot deals. I got these gill nets and set them right down in Willis Wharf Creek. And, uh, they have to drift along like the shark nets, you know. And I set, had three of them. And I'd set them out a thousand feet apart from each other, and they'd go all the way across and sit there and drift along. And when the tide slacked up, just go there and take them. And it was trout was the main thing. Gray trout? Yeah. Oof. And, uh... There used to be some big ones come up in there too, yeah, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. It was, uh, it was. There were some nice ones, yeah. yeah. Of course, we were, I was only had about a four-inch net. Couldn't get so big. Right. Get them, it was why you get one tangled up with his teeth. With his teeth, yeah. Yeah. You, you, you mentioned that you, you had those in between the clam boats. Were, you were okay. on some offshore uh, clam boats, is that? Yeah. Uh, old Frankie Smith was captain of one of them, and I'd known him all my life. <clears throat> and uh, But what I was doing, messing around on it. No, I was working at Bayshore. At that time, that's what another one of them 10-year increments. <laughs> Worked for the highway department as a uh, uh, quality control person for what Bayshore was making for bridges to go in Virginia. And uh, I did that for 10 years. <laughs> and then things slacked off. I got tired of that. And uh, I hear about these boys cleaning up on these clam boats. Damn, man. And uh, 
So I went with Frankie. And the first year, now this was, would have been uh, right in the mid-70s, late 70s maybe. The first year when I made $55,000. And at that time, that was a lot, that was a good money, you know. <clears throat> and I kept doing it. Next thing you know, they, they made me a captain. And I, what I went on as a, as a deckhand, and a month later, Frankie made me a, a mate. The, there's no such thing in Clambush as a first mate or second mate. It's only a mate. Yeah. And he was really, the Coast Guard requires an alternative captain in case something happened, get sick or something, that you, right. somebody's eligible to take it over. And you got to be licensed. So I was licensed captain for a while. And uh, I ran her. And we did all right. But what, was, what kind of boats were they? Were they wooden hauled? No, uh, the one I was in, yeah, they were some wooden hauled. Uh, I know of Vernon Lewis. I don't know if you know Vernon Lewis. He was a house painter. He passed on now, but he was on an old wooden, uh, sort of like one of them uh, <clears throat> upper bay by boat. Right, types. right. Cabin in the back. Yeah. <clears throat> and uh, they were dredging over the side. And then something happened. She went to pieces, and he was in the ocean for three days and nights floating on a small piece of fly, plywood wow. that he had to have come across. It was summertime. but Wow. But they got him. But they found him. Yeah, wow. And, they, and two or three people did drive, drive, drive on it. Wow. And then uh, it was another one. When they, when the money got big in that, these boat builders and, and Miles Oyster Company got in it big time, and they started just making these ocean boats that looked about like a box, shoe box with a bow on it, and they weren't were not able ocean boats at all. <clears throat> and uh, there was one called the Norman D. Norman B. Anyhow, uh, boy running her was was the first mate they left it when I get, got to be mate on our boat, Jimmy Smith <clears throat> from Willis Wharf. And he was running her and you remember you remember Tony Pardon? Yeah. He drowned on her. Wow. Tony and uh She capsized. Oh, Tony. Was it Tony? Or Tony's brother. Anyway, uh, <clears throat> she just had a hole uh, that you put your clams in after you caught them. And uh, they never, you, you, in rough weather, we always filled the hole so that it couldn't get out Shift, of balance. Yeah. You know? But apparently, a big old sea fixed them in, filled the offshore cages, and listed her, and then no one came and hit her and rolled her over. Wow. And so these <coughs> these these were um, were dragger type dredge boats, yeah, or, right. and, but you dragger, weren't going for like our normal hard clam, right? What were, what was the species you were after? Uh, was it the ocean cohog? No, we did do that the last the last couple of years. It was strictly ocean cohog. That was amazing, but it wasn't in the market for them at right. first. Uh, these were called uh, sea clams. Oh yeah, that's all. Yeah, and, they, they uh, kind of had the shell with. Was a little fragile, yeah, right? Little fragile. And it had uh, great big, great big. Uh, we call them hearts, but abductor muscles on each end of the shell, and that's the only part of it they use. They, they make fried they clams out of it. it. Cut the bellies out. Yeah. And who uh, was Howard Johnson? Howard Johnson's hotel chain. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Restaurant chain. And, uh, and that kind of after ten years, that sort of died out. And, how long would a uh, trip be when you take when you leave to from? Till we loaded. Yeah. Till you loaded, so it could be two days a week. Most time about three days is three what days. it took. But then we were working up off of uh, I have, uh, uh, New York off of uh, what's the main shoot the big long river Island? right off the big oh, river uh, Hudson uh, right off the Hudson River. It goes out and dies out in deep water, and then uh -huh. it's a hill, a hill over Sea Mound out there. Yeah. Yeah. We were working up there, and it would take uh, about 10 days, I mean 10 hours, to get, we went loaded in, in uh, Deep Creek across the bay there uh -huh. for the company. Uh, and so you go out, you take take a, like the ocean surf clams, I mean those, uh, those coal hogs, they were so thick 
the first time I sat on one, towed it a little, and she just bogged right down. And then Giannis, we got to change our gear and do something. Pulled them up, and the clans were spilling right over the blade. Wow. I must, <laughs> must have been two cages in that darn dredge. Wow. And, and we loaded in, uh, we used to, we loaded in six hours, take us eight hours steaming the little creek and unload them in six hours back loaded again. And we did that for about a six weeks, six months, I mean. Wow. And uh, <clears throat> finally that they put, they outlawed it. Yeah. The, uh, the ocean people, whoever it is, oceanic people in charge, came and told us which day you could work and uh, which day, you, if, if, if your day came and it was blowing 30 mile an hour, you couldn't go to work. But you could only work on that day. Mother Nature didn't want to work a, on that schedule. No. <laughs> and you had a, day, uh, a limit of what you could catch. And, and uh, they only, they also, they give you a zone that you could work in. And, and, and surf clams, they, they were surf clams too before they shut it down. There's always, just like the dune system on an island, you got a dune ridge and you got a valley ridge between another, and the bars go offshore just that same way, right on, way off. You got a, a bar and a slough, a bar and a slough. And uh, the top of the bar was nothing but pure sand, that wasn't nothing. The bottom was mud down in the slough. But the uh, the clams were right on the edge of that bar, you know, right? And uh, you had to do, do your fling a phylometer and search one of these places out and such a buoy site and tow and that's where you had you yeah, had yeah. if you weren't there you weren't gonna catch it today, period. Right. But they, they said, No, you gotta be right here. But it may not have been anything there. there. <laughs> I mean they assumed that clams were all over the whole bottom. But, right, they weren't. So we got out of that again. Well, at some point in all these jobs, you started making decoys. <laughs> when, when was that? Uh, that was way later. Well, I'd done it all my life, pretty much. You remember the first decoy you ever made? Yeah. How old were you? About 10, 11. I and mean, what species was it? It was uh, whatever you want it to be. Yeah. Generic uh, duck. Uh, it was probably I think I think I made it to be uh, a, a baganser because my uncle come along and told me it looked like a woodpecker. <laughs> <laughs> I gave it had a red head, you know. yeah. And uh, and the only paints that I had available were what people had left over from painting the boat. Painting the boat. You might get some gray, you get some white, and then red copper. You know. Yeah. That was the only red you could get. Yeah. And uh, you could make, uh, you always had blacks, you could make some black and gray, make gray as you want, but it was hard to find any other color. Yeah. But uh, the first thing I even thought about that was me and old Larry Hamlin. Do you all remember back in the 50s even maybe, uh, there was a Clorox, it was a bleach that the ladies used in their clothes laundry. It was called a Clorox, and it had a brown glass bottle. Hmm. You know, about a, about a gallon bottle, about that big around, about that tall. And it was glass, and you poured a label off, it was just brown glass. And me and Larry Hamlin, this buddy of mine, we could get in this in a boat tied up to the dock, and just get down behind it, and uh, throw these things up to tide, and the bottle would come floating by, and a shell duck would land to it. <laughs> That was your first decoy, it was a brown <laughs> glass bottle. Yeah. Huh. And uh, so, so we'd, we'd do that until we'd run out of bottles. <laughs> and there was a trash dump on that little road that goes up to where, uh, right. I don't know who lives up there now anymore. But we ran out of bottles. And uh, <clears throat> I started making some more, but like I say, it was just a, a block of wood with another block nailed to it. Just anything. Use them and leave them. Just some way when you got done shooting that for that day. But you were actually using them to hunt hunt ducks. Yeah. And then when I really got into it, though, it was with Pete Peterson. He, Pete and I were down at uh, Bayshore and Bobby Brady and Bo Lewis. 
go working down there, and we, we started hunting together, fishing together. And uh, Pete said, Dan, we, we, we had a bunch of them old uh, cheap plastic decoys, you know, you buy from the time and dime, door, dime store with <laughs> plastic decoys. And uh, Pete said, well, why don't we go ahead and make some? And he'd gone up and seen, uh, gosh, who was it up there at the, the hotel, at, I mean, the, the museum in uh, Salisbury is named. Oh, uh, the Wards. Yeah. Lynn yeah. and Steve Ward. Went Chris up and Field. talked to the Ward brothers, and they were, and uh, he come back and he made one. I said, yeah, maybe I can do that. And then we sat down and started making some together. And yeah. I don't know, I wish I had one of them left, but I never put the paint in it. But, Pete's a lot better carver than I am. Yeah. I, but, uh, I've always thought that, um, I think because you've been out so observant and all, but uh, your ducks and geese are awesome, but I've always really, your uh, shorebird decoys, I think always capture the, um, that character of those shorebirds, well, those old hunting style decoys like that, yeah. because I think you've seen so many of them. That's uh, well. That's what Dan always told me to make it a, to paint a decoy. He said, "Don't look in that book and see what that says. Watch the bird, and if you have to, squint your eyes a little bit so it's fuzzy, and he'll have a stand out pattern, right. and that's the way you paint your decoy. And that's what the bird is seeing. He's you know he's just coming in, and that's where I basically still do it. You know, yeah, and." Uh, <clears throat> Maybe put a little line or two in there to touch it up. Maybe it'll look yeah. good. For people. For the ladies. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so over, over the years of, um, I know you've used a lot of different materials, but you mentioned you had used some of that leftover juniper wood and, and all. Um, what kind of materials have you used for, for your decoy making? Uh, that's it, uh, white cedar. And then later on, uh, I, the uh, there. What is that tree? Polonia, the cottonwood. Uh, you ever use uh, any well, of that? I, I didn't. I didn't like it. it was too greeny. I yeah, like that was greeny. Then my shingtig, the shingtig boys use that. A little bit of white pine, maybe. But the white pine. Yeah. I got that. Got that from you. <laughs> don't tell people because uh, <laughs> Pete will not like that. Uh, no, Pete. <laughs> uh, you don't need nothing but. And, uh, but it works so much easier, you know. But the, uh, the bottom six or seven feet of a uh, tulip tree, what is that? Oh, what yeah, is yeah. What is the uh, real name of them thing? Tulip poplar? Yeah, yeah. For exactly. Poplar. Yeah. Uh, the top from, from this high up is grainy and, and it's just no kind at all, but below that, hmm. it's just as dense and soft. You can go against wow. the grain. And my brother-in-law had one removed from that head, one hanging over his house, he was afraid of it. And uh, he gave me, I was able to, the guy that cut the tree down and wiped it up a lot for me so I could, yeah. I used them for a couple of years, a couple of years, I guess. And, uh, well, you've always been, uh, um, at least I know with me and with other people, very willing to, you know, talk about little tricks of the trade and, and, and how you've done it. And I, I'm very appreciative of that. Well, uh, who, who were some of the people that maybe you learned from or were influenced by? I don't know. Just looking at their decoys. I, uh, I never have been under anybody's training at all. Uh, but Charlie Birch yeah. was Willis Wharf Carver, and he was just simple. And, and I loved his work, man. It really impressed me. I see that and, in a lot of your and, birds. Uh, I have, in fact, I got, a, I'm in a lot of brands. I took uh, James A. Kelly, Jimmy Kelly's dad, had a brand, and uh, I just put a spotlight over it and traced the pattern, <laughs> shadow it. One of them, Charlie Birch's mm -hmm, decoys. Yeah. And, made, and uh, our Hudson, I always liked his birds. Mm -hmm. so I never, never met him in person, but I always liked his birds. Uh, I've seen you do some. I've actually got a couple. A you made that Hog tail. Island style with yeah. the animated heads. Yeah, and, you know, yeah. That, that uh, I haven't been doing that for very long. 
I did, I did do them years ago, and then it got wasn't worth doing, you know, hardly. Uh, Bill Purnell wanted something like it. I think I made him a bunch. But uh, <clears throat> but just you, you gotta see the the uh, impression. You gotta let that bird make an impression in your brain of what it looks like. Uh, talking about shorebirds, I had uh, I had a bunch of uh, had eight, seven or eight cob uh, curlew decoys. And that decoys wasn't worth anything much then. I didn't even think about what they were worth. That was right out of high school. And uh, you hold them in your hand, and it, it didn't look much like, you know, what is this? A little baby will work. But you set that out on the marsh edge, you get 30 feet away from it, and it comes alive. Looks yeah. just like he's ready to take off. Amazing. Some and, of the uh, best decoys look ugly as sin in your hand, exactly. but you put them on the water in the marsh, and it's just yeah. like, whoa. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and my patterns, here's a little thing that I, I've told people. I'd always uh, rough out a piece of pattern that I thought it burned. Say, say I want to make a teal, green wing teal. So I'd sketch out a pattern and hang it on my kitchen wall. And every day I'd walk by it and I'd go, I believe that bill needs to be a little bit longer, you know. And then the next day, uh, maybe the breast could be a little fuller. And after a while, you walk by and say, yeah, that looks about right. And then you... Uh -huh. Spend a little time uh -huh. thinking on it. Yeah. Yeah. But this clam boot business, that was, uh, like I say, around the clock. You worked till you got a load, and then you steamed on in. Uh, we came down the coast one time, I was running there, and uh, it was a north of a hurricane inland of us. I don't know if it was Donna or what. Anyway, we had a south east wind that blew our wing, our, our wing gauge blew right off the path. Wow. That's a weird locked, wind locked to in have at, Locked here. in at 85. Wow. And... Uh, Coming down there, but we made that all right. Uh, you can look and see the, the stern ramp and water, surf, waves, and then the cabin. Wow. You know, Jeez. At, at time, because it would run back off. But we filled our tanks up first before it came. We, we knew it was coming. Um, I imagine between. Those... Had a guy, had a guy on there working there. He was from Shingtig. He kept talking about. Uh, I'm a Christian, and I don't mind admitting that I love the Lord. And uh, I didn't preach to people or anything like that, but uh, he kept, I ain't no such thing as God. I'm an atheist, or whatever, kept saying. But I look back, I mean, there was a bump, there was a bench thing behind the wheelhouse, and when I looked at that back of me on that wheelhouse, Roy was down on his hands and knees. <laughs> I was like, who are you praying to? <laughs> But when that sea was coming across her. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I bet that was scary. I, well, I bet you, uh, with these jobs, and I know some of the decoy makers, you've really met some what we call characters over the years, oh, interesting boy. people. We had to hit the Coast Guard. A boy named Morris from down the road there. He, he wound up beating up on a teenage girl on a railroad track, his sister or something, and they put him in prison. But uh, Frankie Hardy, he, he's down on the dock. Every time you come in and pack out, there'd be a half a dozen guys standing there. Hey, you need a man? You need a man? You know, Wanting to work. One of them quit or something got hurt or something. So this guy, Morris, yeah, Frankie said, yeah, come on. And uh, we were, I ain't working, you know. And uh, he was, we had a bunk down in the engine room. Uh, Warm toasty down there, you know. I bet. Uh, not very quiet. You got to put plugs. Yeah, I'm sure say not very quiet. Yeah, put plugs in your ears, <laughs> you know. But he came up. <clears throat> he said, "Frankie, you got to take me ashore. I got to go home." He said, "Well, I can't go home. We're not loaded yet. I can't have it. We got to go home." He said, "What's my?" He said, "My mama called me on the hydraulic line down there and told me that I had to get home right now." <laughs> the, the hydraulic line's <laughs> not a phone line. <laughs> right. So Frankie said, I'll tell you what, 
we'll get the Coast Guard to come and get you. <laughs> and we called them and they come and took him in. Took yeah. him in the Ocean City, I think. Yeah, there wasn't any cell phones then. No, no cell, cell phones. phones. Yeah. VHF, I guess, was about right. all you have for communication. <clears throat> yeah. And nav navigation, it wasn't any GA. Uh, GPS, navigation was yeah. uh, Loran, they used to call mm -hmm. it. Uh, they had radio waves that would broadcast out from down the, down the country and then up New England. And where these crossed, yeah. you could get two numbers and identify where you were on there. And uh, so you had to kind of do a little math, a little figuring, figuring leeways and all that stuff. But yeah. Uh, <laughs> First time I went aboard the boat with Frankie, and at night we got loaded up. And he said we were off of uh, Shingatig somewhere then, I think. He said, "Take her on home." I said, Are "You sure?" He said, "Yeah, just." I said, well, "I said, well, what's the course?" He said, "Anywhere between south and southeast." Which is nine. <laughs> That's pretty uh, good. Forty-five degrees, so <laughs> right. you can hit Florida or right. Cape Charles. Right. <laughs> Yeah, he was a character, Frankie was, anyway. Good at what he did, but he was you, one like him. You told me one time, going back about the geometry stuff, that your dad was making, took a square and made a circle. <laughs> yeah. You told me about one fellow was telling you about they had laid out some oyster grain. It, it, oh, well, that was Larry Hammond. He, he released some oyster grain. And uh, he said, they, they, they come out there and survey that and lay that out. And it, when it got done with it, it was laid out in a perfectly square triangle. <laughs> <laughs> so, it was Larry. You could go either way with that, right? You met Larry, didn't you? You met him. He was... Uh, he was part of your dock he was, crowd. He was you? born on Hog Island, but he never came, never went around much. I don't know. He might have been down here once or twice, but... Uh, yeah, he and I were buddies. We were just two years apart in age, and we grew up playing together as toddlers almost, and uh, fished together and worked together a lot. And I, I miss him. He's been gone four or five years. But. Well, um, when do you remember any of the other Hog Island folks that were around Willis uh, Wharf when you were growing yeah, up? Yeah, when I was growing up, almost half the people in Willis Wharf were from Hog Island, but I don't remember a whole lot. They all... Uh, the biggest thing about most of the hog owners was their vocabulary. And uh, the Bowens cursed with every breath. <laughs> they used GD like you'd say and or so. <laughs> you know, just, just run it in, you know. <laughs> and uh, Or they'd talk about somebody and say, you know, so-and-so, that son of a bitch. And, you know, <laughs> it's just the way they talk. You know. <laughs> and, uh, the, yeah. But uh, <clears throat> but I knew, of course, Vic Simpson built all them skies. Yeah, he was a boat builder. Right. He was from there. Uh, uh, Vic's, you know, there's a Vic Simpson yep. still living there. And my Uncle Chester, he was funny. Uh, he, he was a good-hearted fellow, but he's the one that could sign, a really good sign. But uh, <clears throat> we before we had a car, before Dad had a car, we used to walk at the Exmoor every Saturday and get a haircut and watch the matinee movie. They had to play an old John Wayne or Western movie, Roy Rogers or something. And Chess would always have a quarter in his hand. And of course, I was just a little fellow. He threw that ahead of me and run ahead like he found it. He said, nope, that's mine. You can't get it. He, he did that. He never did let me catch one. <laughs> you thought he was piling up the money in his yeah, pocket. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, he was a, uh, he was a likable, I liked him all right, but he was, when uh, he was uh, about 10, I think mom said, 10, 11 years old, they were ice skating. Ice skating used to be a big thing on a hog home. And uh, he tripped some kind of way and done a flip and fell and hit the back of his head was the first thing he hit the ice. Wow. And he was unconscious, totally unconscious for three days. Wow. Laying there and, it's, and everybody was all around knew he was going to die. But he came to, came around and said, I'm hungry, Mom, we got anything to eat. <laughs> and, uh, but he's, you could see his, his mentality had slipped way back. It affected him. Wow. And uh, he, he was, uh, 
I don't know if, if you talk to him 15 minutes, you can tell he wasn't quite there, yeah. you know. He was, I liked it, he was all right, but he, he just. Uh, did you did y'all ever ice skate in Willis Wharf? Or? Never, no, we never did. I've yeah. never done it in my life. Yeah, me either. Uh, Supposedly, they used to do it on Fungate Creek all the time. I used to have a roller skating rink in Expo. I did that a lot. That's a new one on me. Yeah, where, uh, right where uh, Tanger's Drugstore used to be. Okay. Uh, that uh, shirt place across, or yeah. that factory. Yeah, the old shirt factory. Tile place, I the guess. Tile place is now, yeah. yeah new right, Ravina. Right, right on the corner. Okay. That street that runs down there. That was a movie theater. Yeah. And uh, they had matinees. And, yeah. And then later on in the weekend, they had it uh, like at 8 and 7, it started at 7 or 8 or something like that. But, uh, but this uh, clam boat business, boy, that was, we caught a fire one time. Uh, ben, ben Mears, you know, Ben, he was on the crew with us. He was a good fella, a good friend of mine. And uh, I was, we had the pilot house could look out over the deck and the stern ramp. And then on each side of that, it had a, we called it a dog house, where uh, the exhaust pipes came up and they had stairways. You could walk, go down to the, uh, to the engine room. And uh, I looked and it was just a little puff of smoke coming out of a vent like that. I said, Ben, go down and see if you see what's going on in the engine room. He ran down, he came back, hey, what? That was the signal he came That out. was the signal for fire. <laughs> and, uh. Wow. Fire on a boat's not a good thing. And, uh, we were, got the Coast Guard, and the Coast Guard was able to get it out for us, but we, she was wow. disabled. And, uh, they had to tow her to Little Creek and put her on the railway. And I worked on another boat then forgotten what her name was now. And uh, I sank her. No, that was the Christie sank her too. <laughs> <coughs> and the, uh, this, that's a funny story about the Coast Guard. <laughs> I, uh, <coughs> going in Ocean City Inlet, I don't know if you're familiar with it or not, but they got a long stone jetty that runs out the inlet. And uh, people walk on it, fish on it and all that stuff. And it goes out to a slough and uh, right straight off as a bar. But you go out and hit the slough and they had it booted up. And you could run down the slough for about a quarter of a mile or maybe a half mile. And it was booting you and it was a, a break in the bars and you could go out and get yep. in the ocean. Right. And uh, <clears throat> so I was behind the same boat as Norman D, the one that flipped over. Uh -huh. She drew 11 feet, and we drew 12. And uh, <clears throat> right where you went out to this bar and turned, there used to be a pile of rocks that they had, a barge had capsized when they were building the jetties. Oh. And uh, they had a buoy on it, you know, a, 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 a hazard buoy, a white and black hazard buoy. And uh, that was right at where the, the channel split like it went up on the eastern side. I mean, the northern channel went up where charter boats and Right. All those came out of Ocean City. And then the, uh, <clears throat> we had to go around the other side because there was more water on the southern channel. But uh, those charter boats didn't draw four or five foot of water and they'd, they'd just go over and rock and rod, didn't bother them at all. And uh, then the buoy went away in a storm and it had been gone for a couple of years and nobody ever mentioned it to us that it was ever there. Wasn't on the chart, <clears throat> no, no, no nothing. And uh, so we were going on out the inlet, and uh, Jimmy came to the slough and turned, went on, and I was right in his wake. I mean, right in his wake, going on, boom, boom, like that. I mean, she ride right up out of the water, and that's when that's when I told Ben to go down and look what happened. That's when he came up, water coming. Uh, that was the water sign. <laughs> yeah, I got you. Water rushing in. So uh, I was able to get her turned around. And uh, between the two channels I was talking about is a bar, sandbar. I don't have out, but show water. And I was able to run her right up in there. And uh, 
basically ground level, her. Level, level, run her ground. She was level with the her top deck was level with the with the water at that mm -hmm. time. And on the ebb tide, it was she'd be a buck, maybe three feet out of the water. Wow. And uh, the Coast Guard called me over to explain what happened. Well, you know, and I said, well, where, uh, and they tell me it used to be a buoy on that pile of rocks. And yeah, I think it was at one time. And uh, so he said, we don't see any fault here. And he wrote me up a accommodation for saving the ship and crew. Because <laughs> our buoy wasn't <laughs> that there. In the Coast Guard, <laughs> yeah. Cause, uh, well, it seems like a turn. They say we're able to patch the boat up and get it back. Yeah, we, well, a boy named Bobby Barnes. I don't know if you ever knew him or no. not. He's a good boy. He, he's the one who dug the trench by, almost by hand, had a little thing, and laid the pipe and welded each joint from Chrisfield to Shigatick for fresh water. Wow. He's the one who laid the fresh water pipe over wow. there. And that's below the surface of the bottom. Yeah. But uh, big old strapping boy. But he well he, but he came her. and uh, <clears throat> first thing he did was uh, made a plywood patch with a rubber hose gaskets, you know, and then run chains all the way around her and clamped her down, just hold it onto her. Uh -huh. And we pumped her out. Coast Guard got her pumped out, and uh, when we got her pumped out, carried her back to the dock. And then had a load of concrete came poured right down and covered the whole hole. Oh wow! And when that hardened, then we towed her back to Little Creek. Wow, quite a process. Yeah, we were out of work for a long time, but I thought I was going to go. Well, always being eight, I yeah, <clears throat> always laid back on you know kept a little bit aside just in case you know. But, and Frankie, he always said, "Y'all need help. You need me. Let me know." I, I can help you out, you know. Looking out for each yeah. other. <clears throat> but uh, I was able to go back to working on the water. And uh, working as an individual waterman, which no such thing anymore. They, they just, they're just they all aquaculture, which is good, because if that had been for them, I don't guess, because uh, all the land is leased up, you know. But you could go... People had land that was open for the public called the Baylor Survey. And, uh, or if people owned it, they'd let you work on it, clam, and all they carried back was oysters. So they don't, don't get my oyster bed, sure. And, uh, I could go down. No captain, no, no, nobody over me, no captain, no crew, nobody under me, just me. Nobody worry about but yourself. Nobody worry about myself. Go down, get, catch my clams or oysters, come in, set them on the dock, lay cash in my hand. You didn't have to fill out all these reports and, and mess down. And then go home, stick it in the bank. That was it. You didn't, you know, didn't have nobody to worry about but myself. And uh, if I didn't want to work, I didn't have to, but I did. I couldn't, yeah. I'd have to go out. My dad was that way. He said, he said, I don't care what's going on, you go down and dock when it's time to leave. And if it's time to leave, you still get to the dock, it's blowing too hard, go back home. But go down and dock and see it first. Make sure the wind is actually right. blowing <laughs> right. down the dock. Yeah. yeah. Well, Kenny, I tell you, man, I've, I've really enjoyed hearing you, hearing you talk about all your experiences. I mean, you've really lived a rich life, I think. And I really appreciate uh, the fact that you've been able to share, not just what, what today, but uh, carving stuff and over the over the years I've learned so much about the the wildlife out here it's helped me in my job even and um, I'm just real tickled that you were willing to do this and, well, and I really appreciate uh, it I don't feel like I know enough to be any good to anybody uh, nah. advice on a decoy I can say get the image of the bird from a distance know the bird you know you got to know what you're doing and, uh, and be specific. And like another old fellow used to tell me, he said they were whittling. He said, always, said, he, that was a Charles guy, Charles Chester. I said, well, he said, always cut away from yourself, never towards yourself. <laughs> that was his safety. That was his, that was his life's, life's advice. Somebody else told you something. Uh, well, maybe it was your dad about uh, 
just taking away stuff from a block of wood that when you were making a decoy what, what was the main principle Dang. that's okay <laughs> i'm sorry that's all right we'll get it we'll get it uh what uh chopping away everything but yeah it didn't you say uh, whittle everything away to yeah uh, you say take a nice block of wood chop off everything it doesn't look like a duck there you have it so that's that's just, that's the simple version right uh, sure. <laughs> All right, thank you, Kenny. Being my old self, knocking stuff over. <laughs>